Hello, I'm David Mandy, president of o and Partners. I want to welcome you today to the SSR Mining Town Hall Call. We really appreciate your interest and attention. Um, SSR trades under the ticker symbol SSRM on the NASDAQ global market, as well as the Toronto Stock Exchange. A little background on o and for anyone that, for those of you that are new to the uh, broadcasts, we're in the business of bringing public companies and investors together in real time. The information presented is already publicly available. We're not a commission firm. We're not a broker dealer. We're simply a, a communications company. Um, as I said, all the information is publicly available, and we're hoping by giving you context and uh, uh, bringing this information to your awareness, you'll be able to make a better um, informed investment decision. Um, uh, we want to answer all of your questions uh, today, so if you have a question, please feel free to chat in your questions you, um, during the webinar through the GoToWebinar um, or just a uh, pane, question pane, or you can just email this. Um, if you're receiving your audio through telephone connection, uh, please note you will not be able to hear the pre-recorded segment of the town hall webinar, which starts just the first 10 minutes. Um, 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 uh, 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 so um, we can also, you can listen to that and replay. Um, before we turn to our host, Paul Benson, who's the president and CEO of SSR, we're going to start with it, um, Dave Kranzler from the Mining Stock Journal in Denver. As anyone knows these calls, we like to first discuss macro, what's going on, how it can affect the mining stocks, particularly precious metals. Uh, David spent many years working at various analytical jobs and trading jobs on Wall Street. Um, he has a master's degree in business administration from the University of Chicago. Um, he writes a blog to help people understand and analyze what's really going on in our financial system and economy. And certainly um, um, this is, uh, a very timely discussion. Um, there's a lot of questions out there. So on that note, I'm going to turn the call over to Dave. Thanks for having me on again. It's a it's a pleasure to be here. Real quickly before I get started, um, I'm going to try and keep this under 10 minutes so that we can all get to the main show. But I publish a uh, investment newsletter called the Mining Stock Journal. It's a it's a bi-weekly newsletter, so twice a month. And I focus on junior exploration stocks because I think that's the, the area of the of the mining stock sector where there's the greatest amount of price inefficiency, which means there's tremendous upside in these stocks. Of course, there's also tremendous amount of risk. And it's to me it's a game of stock selection. And I also do um, recommend on occasion large cap producers and SSR mining is one of them. And I also include uh, ideas for using in the money calls if you don't want to lay out the amount of capital required for, for big positions in the, in the large caps. Uh, also, I don't have any companies that sponsor me. I don't take payments from companies. And I personally or my fund invests in very, a lot of the ideas that I present in the, in the newsletter. So David Mandy and I thought it might be interesting to kind of flush out the effect this coronavirus crisis might have on the precious metals sector. And before I, I kind of get to that, I just wanted to step back a little bit. Uh, I don't think, in my opinion, corona is not the cause of this market turmoil that we're see seeing. It's essentially the same type of market forces that were at work in 2008 only I think they're worse this time around. There's, we've had from the money printing and, and the near interest, near zero interest rate policies by the Fed um, and essentially reckless monetary policies globally. We've got, we've had, you know, eight to 10 years of this financial system excesses and imbalances that have built up. And as I mentioned, it's, it's gotten worse this time. Uh, you know, the degree of, of morally hazardous investing in both subprime credit, leveraged loans, and, and just the stock market in general has, has become, at least to me, kind of horrifying. And 
Whereas in the past, we've seen asset bubbles that are kind of relegated to certain sectors of the stock market, except maybe in 29. Um, I mean, this time around, it's, it's been a general asset bubble across all sectors, except precious metals. And the way I see Corona is that it's essentially uh, an exogenous trigger that kind of set all these market forces in motion and basically forced the market to do what was going to happen anyway, you know, given enough time. And I think, I think something like we're seeing right now, although it might not have been quite as severe if uh, Corona didn't appear on the scene, uh, you know, it's the, the, the end game will play out the same way. And I think we're going to see a lot more devastation in the stock market. And, and even if the central banks try to prop it up with a lot more printed money, it's, it's still going to, still going to yield that end result. So, um, now, in terms of, of how the coronavirus crisis may or may not affect the gold and silver and the, and the uh, mining stocks, I mean, you're seeing today, obviously, I think we all feel uh, a lot less wealthy than we did on Friday. And especially, you know, you would have thought that gold and silver were going to take off and, and I, they will. And we started to see that last night. And I think right now what's happening is you're just seeing a rush to the exits, especially by leveraged hedge funds that are selling anything they can that has a bid in order to get the liquidity and, and forestall margin calls. And I wouldn't be surprised if we hear about some hedge fund blowups this week. And, and the net result of that ultimately is I think we'll see a, a U-turn in the precious metals and, and um, we're going to see much higher levels. Now, I've heard... And, Probably all of you have heard this idea that you know coronavirus might shut down um, mines globally, and uh, I, I think that's a possibility. But I and I but I think I think where we might see production and supply disruptions wouldn't be wouldn't be because they'd shut down the mines because they're worried about uh, the employees catching the virus. I mean, a lot of these mines are in pretty remote areas. They're probably much safer to, to be right now than, than large cities. I think where the disruptions might come from is, is to the extent that these mining companies have trouble getting equipment supplies that are manufactured in Asia. And we've seen this in the past. I think it was you know, 2008, 2009, 2010 or something like that um, when there was a shortage of the large tires that are used on mining trucks. So um, that, I think that's probably the, the only ramifications in terms of, of mine production output, and it, it may or may not affect the supply of, of uh, gold and silver production. Um, however, I think the much larger factor and the primary factor is that the central banks globally, and we've already seen that with the Fed today, is they've, they've increased their, their repo money printing operations by 50%. Um, is, they're going to use this as an excuse to print a lot more money to try and hold the financial system together. And gold will anticipate this devaluative effect on the, on the dollar and all fiat currencies. And that's the catalyst that's going to drive gold and silver a lot higher. Um, and then the mining stocks will, will naturally follow because it's certainly to the extent that we see much higher gold and silver prices, it's going to increase the value of the gold and silver that gets produced, but it's also going to increase the gold and silver that's in the ground, the provable reserves that these junior exploration companies have. So a much larger factor is going to be the devaluative effect on fiat currencies from the money printing. And in chart one here, I plot, it actually, I didn't plot it. It comes from Jesse's Cafe Americaine. He's a good friend of mine. And it goes back to the beginning of 2020. And you can see that gold and the dollar moved for several weeks. And I've always made the argument that gold is a rate of return have occurred when they're preceded by the dollar moved in, move in tandem. That happened in late 2005 and we did a huge run up into the middle of 2006. And what happens is they move in tandem for a while as the market sniffs out a reason for moving into flight flight to safety vehicles. And then you get a, you know, 
all of a sudden gold and the dollar will diverge where the dollar diverges negatively from gold. And, and when we've seen that pattern is when gold has tended to perform the best over an extended period of time. And then of course, chart two shows, it basically plots gold versus the US dollar for the last five years on a weekly basis. And what I wanted to show there is that there's been, since 2017, a general uptrend in the price of gold and a general downtrend in the, the trading level of the dollar index. And, uh, you know, it, it's essentially, they move inversely, but, but not perfectly inversely. And I, I think we're getting ready to go through another period because of the money printing where where they're gonna move inversely for an extended period of time. So I think this is a much larger factor on, on, than, the, than the viruses on, on how the whole crisis will affect the price of gold and silver and mining stocks. And the precious metals historically have, have sniffed out when central banks are getting ready to print a lot of money. And they're gonna use this crisis as an excuse to print a lot of money and try to hold up the financial system. And that's gonna drive gold and silver. I think eventually, and I don't wanna put a time frame on this, we're gonna see gold and silver will exceed their previous highs and, and probably go much higher from there. And, and of course the mining stocks will probably follow on a lag basis. And that's where your best returns are gonna be made. First in the, the senior large caps, and then it'll filter down to the mid caps and the junior production companies and then the junior explorers where we'll see just some eye-popping gains that'll that'll dwarf some of the gains we've seen in the tech stocks over the last 12 months. So that's that kind of summarizes how I feel about the effect of coronavirus on the precious metal sector and I'm looking forward to the SSR mining presentation. I think it's a, a fantastically run company. And I'll be curious to see if, if they get any questions about um, the coronavirus and how they might how they think it might affect their business. Thanks for your time. Thank you, Dave, very much. Appreciate that. Um, now we'll turn to our host, Paul Benson. Paul's the president and CEO. Um, he's been with SSR Mining since 2015. He has 30 years of experience in the business, in the mining business, both technical and business capacities. Uh, he was CEO and managing director of Troy Resources. And before that, he spent 20 years in executive and operating roles in Australia and overseas with big mining companies, BHP Billiton, Rio Tinto, and also Renison Goldfields. Um, I guess what this all tells us is, and, and the fact is that Paul is a very, he's a successful mine builder, but he also, he specializes in cost cutting, and operating efficiency, as we've seen demonstrated this time at, um, at uh, SSR. Um, he's also sets the bar for corporate governance and sustainability. So on that note, I'm going to turn the call over to Paul. Thanks very much. And good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'll go through the presentation. It follows a fairly standard format and leave questions um, till the end. Standard disclaimer and forward-looking um, uh, statements. We put this graph in. It's, um, we haven't used it before, and it's really just um, gives some thought to what's happening in the market today. Uh, this is a price of gold going back to December um, 2003. And what we want to look at is really the parallels between the crash of 2008 and what we're seeing here now. If you look at the data in the table, um, July leading up to the crash, Dow Jones 11,400, gold sitting at 986. Um, you see the downdraft with the crash, the um, big fall in the Dow Jones, but gold went down as well. And that, I think, confused a lot of people at the time. You know, people were expecting to gold to be the safe haven. But looking back, most of the analysis tended to be that um, gold was actually performing the function of uh, providing liquidity, um, particularly the hedge funds were selling gold to get liquidity to, to meet their margin calls. If you look at what happened through the next um, three years, so go to jump to August 22, uh, 22nd of 2011, you can see that the Dow Jones is uh, still below where it was at its peak in 2008. But look what's happened to the gold price, a doubling of that. Um, 
you know, no one can say if it's going to, history is going to repeat itself, but there's you know, at least a, a logic behind what we're seeing here at the moment. Gold is, um, the ETFs are building up, you know, people are buying gold, gold price has gone down, and we think tend to think that is that liquidity function. Um, but we'd expect once we get through the, the, you know, the eye of the storm that we'll start to see the gold price rally again. Um, echoing the points of the former speaker, you know, unfortunately for um, all of us, the banks are printing money, and that really can only lead to one direction in the long, or medium and long term for gold. Focusing on now SSR, this is really the, the one slide that gives the overview of the company. And what we've done here is listed the issues that a lot of investors have had when they've looked at individual gold companies. Um, and then we look at how we rank compared to each of those points. So obviously, um, you know, it's a mortal sin in this market to miss guidance. We're, one of, uh, we're the only one in our peer group who can say they've met or exceeded guidance for both production and cash costs for the last eight years. Um, and that's certainly a record we want to continue going forward. Uh, we've got a track record of increasing reserves. We've done it again this year, um, while a lot of our peers are seeing declining reserves. We're in a period of organic growth. Um, you know, one of the biggest risks uh, in, in terms of investing in gold companies is single asset companies. If something goes wrong with a single asset, uh, obviously it has a severe impact on the, um, the share price. We've got a diversified operating platform, uh, three operating mines, the two largest in terms of NAV are in two of the most favourable jurisdictions, Nevada and Saskatchewan. Peer leading corporate governance and track record of growing NAV per share through M&A. Um, they're easy statements to throw out, but I'll actually show you the data behind both of those. We're dual listed, strong liquidity, um, particularly on the NASDAQ, and we've got best in class balance sheet. Uh, end of Q4 last year, we finished with $504 million. All the dollars we quote, US, um, uh, throughout the presentation. Just a quick overview geographically, you can see there the three orange dots of the mines, the top one, CB in Saskatchewan, that's a high grade underground mine. Uh, the middle one is Marigold, low-grade open pit in Nevada, and the bottom one is um, the Puna uh, operation, which is in Hui in Argentina, and that's an open pit silver mine. You can see the um, split in terms of revenue, 80% gold, 20% silver. Um, this year, we're looking on the midpoint of guidance, about 425,000 gold equivalent ounces. This slide gives you a good overview of you know, our ownership um, share price performance, etc. So if you look on that top table, usual suspects there, VanEck is the largest. That's mostly the ETF, but the active fund is in there as well. Um, a few quant funds, um, Renaissance Technologies being the, the largest. Uh, the largest active investor there is Investec out of the UK. And if you look at that pie graph on the top right, uh, what you see there, and this is uh, last year was for the first time in our history, uh, more than a um, quarter of the um, uh, shareholding was uh, in outside of North America has come back um, most recently back to dominated in North America. The um, what you can see in terms of the balance sheet that cash position 504 US. The only debt we have are the two convertible notes, so we're net cash. Uh, the one we've highlighted there 2013 is the convertible note. We'll be paying that off next month, so total cash will go down by 115. Net cash will stay the same. Uh, and share price performance, you can see going back, um, that's the beginning of 18, but you can go back further. We've certainly outperformed gold and the majority of our peers. The bottom point on the right there, um, importantly, the um, total number of shares outstanding, 123 million. Uh, and good for shareholders to know that the last time we issued equity to raise capital was back in 2010. So you don't have to um, go to sleep worrying that we're going to uh, issue a statement about a bought deal. Talked about corporate governance, something we have taken very seriously for a long time. You know, we're not new to that um, uh, focus. ISS is the proxy advisor that covers us, and they have a scoring system of one to 10. Uh, if you get a one, um, you're able to use that banner, something we do, we're very proud of. So you can see, uh, in terms of ES and G for the um, uh, governance and social, we get a score of one, um, which is best in class. And you can see on the, the graph at the bottom, we're equal second best in that peer group. So something we have been focused on and will continue to be focused on going forward. 
This is a uh, tells a good story in terms of the production growth of the company. This is gold equivalent ounces. So the bar at the bottom is the silver mine in Argentina converted to gold equivalent. The middle bar is Marigold in Nevada. We acquired that in 2014. And the top bar is CB in Saskatchewan. We acquired that in 16. So you can see from 2018, where you can see that dip in production in that dark bar at the bottom, that was when we were processing low-grade stockpiles at Paquitas while we were building the new Chinchillas operation. Um, but you can see from there significant uh, organic growth as we move out uh, into 2020. Uh, last year, important to note that that was record production in the history of the company, and so this year should be a new record. Um, and it was also made up by a record at each of our three mines. Each mine not only uh, had record production, but they exceeded the top end of guidance. A lot of our peers have um, trouble, uh, re they report low cash costs on the quarterly call, but then struggle to get the cash into the balance sheet, You can see uh, into the bank account. You can see here, uh, this is a graph showing our um, cash balance at the end of each year. The only time it has dipped is when we've acquired something or built something. So you can see in 14, we bought Marigold for cash. And then again in 2018, while we were building Chinchillas down in Argentina, but we've continued to add cash to the balance sheet. I said we use data to back up any of the you know, claims we had on that front page. This is looking at the value we've created through uh, M&A. Uh, so the two acquisitions we've shown there, Marigold uh, and CB, the bar on the left is the announced acquisition price, and the bar on the right is the value that, that's seen through to our shareholders. And that's made up of the, the bottom blue part of the bar. That's the cash we've already extracted. The middle bar is sort of the future looking value. That's the average or consensus of the NAV that the brokers that cover us publish. And then we point to the expiration upside. So you can see outstanding value creation at Marigold, three and a half times what we paid for it. Um, CB doesn't look quite as good, but it's been in the portfolio for about half as long. So I'm sure in a few years time that will be um, um, up around the similar values to Marigold. How it all ties together is the important thing for shareholders. This is, again, independent data coming out of Capital IQ, shows the NAV per share, and it's um, where the orange line, and you can see over that period, um, significant increase, and it's compared to the average of that peer group listed at the bottom. And that really is a sum of everything we do. It's, first of all, good acquisitions, and then running the assets harder, and finally, good um, brownfields exploration success. And I'll, I'll show you the examples of that at each mine. One of the things which people should focus on, particularly in this environment, is margin and what's happening to it. Um, the industry has been criticised historically um, over previous booms that when the price of gold has gone up, the cost of production has gone up. So there's been limited margin expansion. Here what we're showing on a quarterly basis is that margin expansion. Um, you know, it's pleasing to see you know, our focus on cost control. We haven't seen the cost go up. So with rising prices, um, you've seen the margin go up. That Q4 of last year uh, average price was around 14.75. So assuming that um, this quarter uh, will probably be in the 1600s, that you'll see a significant jump up again. Just some data again, backing up the points we made. Um, we've met or exceeded production and cost guidance for eight consecutive years, and obviously that's a record we want to um, continue. So our hope and expectation is that we'll do it again this year. Speaking of which, guidance for this year, if you look down uh, across the page for each mine and then down the page for the relevant um, metrics, uh, if you can see Marigold, if we get the midpoint at Marigold, that will be a new production record, um, exceeding last year's production record. At CB, if we get the midpoint here, that will be a new production record, offsetting last year's production record. And Puna uh, will be about the same as last year. Um, so midpoint of guidance, about 425,000 gold equivalent ounces. Um, another thing worth pointing down at the, the bottom row, um, you can see there, in terms of expiration spend, that will be either equal to or a new record expiration spend of both Marigold and CB. Um, and we wouldn't be doing that if we didn't think we had um, good opportunity to continue to grow those reserves and resources. I'll talk now to each of the mines in a little bit of detail. Um, just worth pointing out on this slide, that's the rope shovel there, it's a um, 4100. It's one of the bigger rope shovels you can get, and we're loading a fleet of um, 24 300-tonne trucks. 
you can see where Marigold is. It's in Nevada. Um, there are two main trends there, Carlin Trend, Battle Mountain Trend. Our, our Marigold is a Carlin style deposit, a low grade sedimentary hosted deposit. I just point on that um, map on the right, you can see a couple of other mines there, Turquoise Ridge um, and Cortez and Gold Strike, and I'll refer back to those in a moment. This is a graph of production and cash costs at Marigold um, since before we acquired it. We acquired the mine in 2014. And you can see the three years before we acquired the mine uh, averaged about 150,000 ounces per annum. The four years after we acquired the mine averaged around 200,000 ounces per annum. And that really reflects us getting the benefit of the capital that Goldcorp, the previous owner, invested in the mine just before we bought it. So we, we got that benefit. The run up in production now, and you can see that midpoint for this year, 233, that will be the new production record. Um, and the following year should be up um, getting closer to 270,000 ounces. Um, that is really driven by grade. We're getting into higher grade material. Uh, for recent years, we've been mining below average grade. So if you keep on mining below average, eventually you have to get above average. This to me is probably the most profound graph in the presentation, one you know, we are most proud of. Uh, the way to read it, the um, bars on the bottom is the um, cumulative amount of gold that has been produced since the mine opened. Uh, opened in 1989 with an eight year mine life. Um, last year celebrated its 30th year of continuous production and last year produced up to around 3.9 million ounces of gold. This year will produce its four millionth ounce of gold. Um, the reflection on the top is actually the reserve at the end of each year um, since we've owned it. So when we acquired the mine in 14, um, the 15 reserve, you can see 2 million ounces. Um, and we've built that up to just around 3.9 million ounces as well. Um, so not only have we continued to produce at a higher rate, uh, we've continued to more than offset depletion. And you can see in that bar at the bottom, our discovery cost at Marigold is under $20 an ounce for uh, new resource ounces. We talk a lot about continuous improvement. Uh, we don't own a tier one uh, mine uh, or body. Um, ours are tier two, um, which means you can make good money. You just have to run them very hard and run them efficiently, which is something that we do. And part of our success there is our uh, internal focus on continuous improvement. We call it um, operational excellence. And for each mine, we can show various um, sets of data that talk to that um, focus on continuous improvement. The shovel you saw in that earlier photo, the 4100, every one of those around the world has a transponder on it and they're continuously sending data back to P&H and at the end of every month they send out to all the owners of the shovels different data sets like this. This is showing productivity um, in terms of how many cycles per hour the shovel's undertaking. What you can see there, we are at the extreme left. We are best in class. We are the uh, world leading operator of that shovel, uh, which flows through to why and how we were able to get our mining costs so low. Our average mining cost is just over $1.50 a tonne, uh, which is one of the lowest in North America. Uh, we can show similar data sets for each of our operations. Just want to look at the evolution of the ground position, and this is really reflecting of our strategy. Um, you can see um, Marigold in the uh, top left there. We acquired that position, uh, Marigold, in 2014. Uh, in 2015, we bought that property where you can see three and four, Valmy. That was owned by Newmont. Marig uh, Goldcorp, who owned Marigold, had always wanted to buy it. Newmont wouldn't sell to a competitor, but they were happy to sell to us. Um, last year, we bought Trenton Canyon, and there's another property down to the bottom right of that um, picture called Buffalo Valley. We acquired both of those off Newmont. Again, Goldcorp had always wanted that ground. Newmont wouldn't sell to a competitor. So we've more than... Um, tripled our land position from when we, uh, the initial acquisition of Marigold back in 2014. What you can see also on that picture are the, the circles highlighting where we're drilling this year um, in terms of metres, um, and it's spread across those three properties. If it's at Marigold, it's probably going to focus on um, mostly reserve, resource conversion to reserves. If it's at Trenton Canyon, there's more discovery of new resources. Um, as I said, we're going to spend $12 million here this um, calendar year, which will be an equal record for this site. Uh, one thing to point to um, there is number six, the deep sulphides. And I just want to 
highlight this because it's an interesting optionality. This is a cartoon of Marigold, and I'll briefly describe it. It's meant to give an indication of how these deposits, uh, the Carlin style deposits, are formed. You can see that on the top um, cartoon, that orange feeder coming up, that's bringing the high grade fluids to surface. When it hits the surface, it, um, that surface sedimentary horizon isn't very absorbent for gold, so it spreads out over a large area and is low grade. So marigold is over five kilometres long um, and averages just under half a gram a tonne. You can also see on that diagram where the feeder comes up and hits that, green, uh, that area called um, comass. That's a different type of geology. It's carbonaceous, very absorbent for gold. So when the high, uh, gold bearing fluids, if they break into that, you tend to get the fluids don't travel very far and you get a higher grade, much higher grade gold. And you can see on the right the text there, that's really highlighting the they're the holy grails of the deposits in Nevada. And I highlighted those names on that map to begin with. But Gold Strike, Cortez, Turquoise Ridge, um, they're big and they're high grade, 10 plus grams a tonne. Um, also in that top cartoon, you can see in that comass formation, the gold goes a certain distance out past that, that green area, that's arsenic in the form of arsenic pyrite. It actually travels further than the gold. And so if you find arsenic and no gold, it's tended to be thought of by the geologist as a pathfinder. Um, so if you're getting arsenic, no gold, hopefully you're getting close to where the gold is. Um, not a very complex model. Gold Corp understood it. They put some deep holes down, found nothing, no gold, no arsenic. When we bought the mine in 14, we gave them some more money. We liked the story. Um, they found nothing, no gold, no arsenic. So back in 2017, uh, we said to them, um, you're not getting any more money unless you come up with a better theory. They brought in some structural geologists from outside, some consultants, and they reviewed the um, geology. And they came up, they understood what had happened was, um, and it's trying to show it in that middle um, diagram. The um, When... Uh, if, you, if you think about marigold, we've been drilling underneath it, but what we've discovered or understand now is when marigold was formed, it was actually up higher and it's come down a, a normal, shallow normal fault, a slip fault, so it's moved down. So we've been drilling where it is today when in reality we should have been drilling where marigold was when it was formed. We like that story. So in 2017, we gave them some more money and said put a, um, some more holes in. And they drilled that hole that you can see, and it's referred to the second bottom bullet point uh, in, the, in the public domain, 43 metres at 0.4 grams a tonne gold. Not, it's not economic at depth. You know, that would be um, economic in the open pit. Um, but what was interesting was that arsenic number. That's the first time we've had um, a significant arsenic number. Um, and we said we were excited by that. And we said, OK, you can have some more money. Where do you want to drill? If I go back to the previous page, it was getting close to where that number two is, um, which was nearing the boundary of Trenton Canyon, which at the time we didn't own. So we said to them, no more drilling, let us go away. It took us two years, but we finally acquired Trenton Canyon and the adjoining property, Buffalo Valley, um, which in, has enabled us to fund that deep sulphide drilling. So of the $12 million that we're giving them this year, about two will be on deep sulphide, 10 on chasing oxide. We're not trying to overpromote it. You know, we've said to people, don't price it into the share price. It's very low probability of success. But if we find something, um, it has huge potential. Um, that those types of deposits were really the company makers for Barrick. So again, just watch our expiration updates to see how we go there. So still plenty of um, upside in Marigold, which is amazing, you know, in terms of um, uh, the, the mine is celebrating its 31st year um, of continuous production this year. Uh, at the beginning of this year, it had a 12-year mine life, and we're pretty confident we'll continue to add to that. Moving now to the mine in Saskatchewan, CB. Uh, this is what it looks like in summer. Uh, if you went there today, you'd be very cold and it would be very white. Um, this is a waterlock site. We bring uh, all materials across the ice roads. We're doing that at the moment during winter, and then our staff and perishables come in, fly and fly out uh, onto a landing strip. We're in the middle of Saskatchewan, uh, only operating gold mine in Saskatchewan. Saskatchewan has a lot of mining, but it's predominantly potash and uranium. Again, you know, a, a continuous growth story. We acquired the mine back in 16, um, and that was a record production year. And you can see each year, in fact, last year was its sixth 
consecutive um, and, uh, annual production record. And if we get the midpoint this year, it will be a new production record. That's driven by three things. One, um, first of all, increasing grade, second, increasing throughput, and third, increasing metallurgical recovery. That last point you can see here, this is a graph of continuous improvement. Um, this is metallurgical recovery, so we bought it in early 16. They already had good metallurgical recovery. They're getting about 96%, but we've had it up over 98 and approaching 99, which is an exceptional number. Um, probably more impressive in terms of impact on total production is the throughput. The year before we bought the mine, that mill was doing about 860 tonnes per day, so it's quite a small mine. The um, last year did about 960 tonnes per day, and this year we're budgeting 1,050 tonnes per day. And in December last year, January this year, we're averaging around 1,050. So, um, you know, we've proven that we can do it. We've just got to do it for the remainder of the year. The important most important fact is that increase in throughput um, from 860 up to 1,050 and that increase in recovery has really been delivered with no capital. It's just operating the plant that existed or that was there better and more efficiently. And you can see that bottom bullet point, we've also focused on the cost side. We've been, uh, reduced cyanide consumption by over 50% since we've acquired it. We've had a similar story in terms of success with uh, Brownfield's expiration. The year before we bought it, um, because it's narrow vein underground, you've got to take into account both measured and indicated, but also inferred. You can only convert from inferred to M&I as you get development closer to it and do the underground drilling. But there was one point, oh, sorry, 400,000 of M&I, one of inferred, so 1.4 million ounce of M&I. Um, this year, um, at the All Reserve Report, 1.7 million ounces with the majority in M&I. Um, so good increase, but you can see also that line above the graph, um, that's after mining 370,000 ounces of gold since we've acquired the mine. And the banner at the bottom, finding cost here, again, very low, less than $30 an ounce in terms of getting it into M&I. So very prospective ground. This is a long section through the mine, um, colour coded for grade, and you can see the legend off to the right there. So anything that bright red is over 20 grams a tonne. The average grade of the reserve is around 10 grams a tonne. So one of the higher grade mines in um, Canada. Uh, the, that long section is all what's called the sand toy um, wall body. Uh, we made a new discovery, which is that purple outline called the gap hanging wall. And we've tried to show the geometry of it. If you drew a cross section into the page of that long section, then that's what you're looking at down on the bottom right. So all the development is in place, and that was put in place for that blue line, which is the sand toy ore body. Um, this gap ore body is sitting on top uh, into the hang wall, so it should be relatively easy to access. We're putting tunnels across to that this year. We should be into it in uh, Q3 or Q4. Uh, we've got about 490,000 ounces in um, uh, indicated and inferred. Uh, we'll be able to transfer some of that into proven and probable once we get those tunnels into the ore body. Um, but impressive that um, yeah, this might, uh, you know, this site has been going for 27 years. Um, Santoy has been mined for you know first or development in there probably about um, six years ago, and we made that new discovery um, last year. So uh, very prospective ground. We're spending $12 million at this operation for um, exploration. Some of it on this page, and anything we find on this page, think of it as extending the mine life. But we're also looking for something brand new. We followed the same strategy here as we did in Marigold. So when we bought Claude, the company, back in 2016, the ground they held was that yellow polygon. Uh, immediately after we acquired them, we picked up the ground, that larger piece of ground to the south. So increase the ground position there by 150%. That's called the Fisher Joint Venture. Um, the reason we did that is that red line, that's the Santoy shear, that's the structure or plumbing system that allowed the gold bearing fluids to come up and form the um, Santoy deposit. So we'll be spending money um, exploring along there this year, um, looking for a new discovery. Importantly, there have already been two one million ounce discoveries on the property, um, Santoy and the old CB mine. So we're hoping you know, we can find a third. It's worthwhile just talking about the history of Santoy to understand the need for perseverance um, in terms of exploration. So Santoy 
It was originally discovered as a small quartz outcrop about two feet across. They channel sampled it and had a bit of gold in it. They had to wait till winter to drill off a frozen lake to get the right angle, so they came back uh, the following year, drilled it um, off the lake, found nothing. They came back the next year, drilled it, found nothing. If they'd stopped then, they would have missed a one million ounce discovery. Uh, it was the third year the, uh, the drill hole hit high grade. So that red line that you see going down the page, that's about 30 kilometres long. So we've got enough ground there to keep us busy drilling for the next you know, four or five years. So as much as we'd like to announce a discovery this quarter or next quarter, we'll be drilling there with enthusiasm you know, for the next four or five years at least. So still good upside um, at CB as well. The final mine, uh, operating mine, is um, what we call Puna. This is made up of this mine here, and that's the Chinchillas deposit, which was originally owned by a junior company called Golden Arrow. Um, they discovered the deposit, and it was a, a size that couldn't justify a new plant. Uh, we had an operation at Paquitas, um, about 40 kilometres away, which we um, commissioned back in 2009, mined an open pit there right through to 2017 and then depleted that pit. And so in the end we did a deal where we formed a joint venture at the time, 75% us, 25% Golden Arrow, and basically it was their open pit feeding our um, uh, processing plant. So the open pit is mined as a standard open pit. The material is brought to surface near the edge of the pit, dropped on the surface, and we truck it 40 kilometres in highway trucks back to our Paquitas operation where we process it through our plant. Um, towards uh, midway through last year, we bought the remaining 25% from Golden Arrow, so we own 100% of that operation. There's not um, any significant expiration potential here, but there's very, very good leverage to um, silver price. So uh, currently we have about 50 million ounces of silver in reserves, and we assume $18 per ounce for the silver uh, when we do the ore reserve calculation. In terms of resources, which are done at $20 an ounce, there's 110 million ounces, and that includes the 50 million in uh, reserves. So there's 60-odd million ounces of resource that's currently in the resource, which would be economic if the silver price was um, $20 an ounce. So the nice thing about it, we don't sterilise it by mining at the higher cutoff grade, but if any time between now and the end of the current mine life, which is uh, around 2026, if, the price, if we view that the price of silver has increased, we can significantly extend the mine life. So good optionality there. Um, just talking about continuous improvement here, um, the, the bars are quarterly mill throughput on a daily basis and the, the line is metallurgical recovery. And again, you see that significant improvement as we um, um, have focused on ramping up that operation, um, feeding the new ore from Chinchillas. But the, does, our budgets are assuming 4,000 tonnes per day, so you can see in Q4 we've actually significantly exceeded that at 4,300 tonnes per day. Finally, just worth touching on, um, you may be aware we have a significant stake, just over 8% in the uh, TSX listed company, um, Silvercrest. Uh, they have the Chinchillas project, high grade, great project that they're drilling out in um, Sonora in Mexico. We, um, we've, we took that position um, two years ago, or yeah, just coming up to two years ago. Our average entry price was 391. Last week they uh, went through $10, so um, significant uplift there. They've come back a bit like we all have in um, the last two weeks, but certainly that there are a lot of catalysts for them. They continue to drill. I think they've got about 18 rigs on site. Uh, yesterday they announced a new high-grade discovery. Uh, in terms of other catalysts, they um, should be entering the um, GDXJ index, I think, this week. They're also looking at putting out their feasibility study towards the end of Q2, or it might be Q, you know, creep into Q3. But it's something that we've been very comfortable holding. You know, we said we'll make up our mind uh, what we do with our position you know, based on what's in the best interest of our shareholders. We'll either end up owning a lot more of it or, or none of it. But we've certainly enjoyed the ride so far, and you know, we'll continue to hold for at least some time longer as we uh, look to see their, um, their exploration results. So that's it in terms of um, the presentation. You know, summary, good production growth um, from a diversified portfolio, a very disciplined management team. You know, we've 
we know how to create value through M and A. We're very disciplined when we look at external opportunities. We have the best in class balance sheet, which means that we get to look at just about any opportunity that comes up externally. Um, yeah, there's certainly excellent um, expiration upside across the company, across the two gold assets. Um, so that's where we are. I think that's the opportune time to head over to um, any questions you might have. Thank you, Paul. Great presentation as always. Uh, let's start with Doug Loud. Doug, do you have questions today for Paul? Yeah, the, the Marigold project looks very interesting, but I was wondering how you were going to get the sulfide block process should you ever get down to it. Yeah, it, um, that sulfide would be refractory. So everything we process and everything in our oil reserves is oxide. Um, to go the, pro, um, the sulfide route, you need a um, autoclave, a you know, pressure oxidation uh, process. You know that if we're lucky enough to discover it, I think you know simplistically we'd put an ad in the paper and run an auction and get you know one of the uh, majors to come and. Um, you know, or a couple of people to try and outbid each other. But, you know, certainly they're company makers. So they, they're big capex. I don't think it's something that we would try and build ourselves. I think we'd get a joint venture partner in. But um, we'll worry about that, you know, um, after if we're lucky enough to find something. Great. And any permitting issues in either of the two um, areas? Per, per, no, permitting in Nevada takes a long time, but it's very transparent. Um, so we've just gone through our... Third, I think it is EIS for Marigold. Um, there's a well understood process. So, um, you know, for a standard open pit, you know, it's probably four years. Um, for, you know, if you go down a pox route on a large underground, you know, it would probably be longer. But, you know, it is the most mining friendly province in or state in, uh, in the US. So, you know, you definitely can permit it, just you go through a set process. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Doug. Uh, we'll turn to Elliot, Elliot Glazer. Elliot, do you have a question today for Paul? Just have to unmute Elliot, please. He's muted himself, but he did send in his question. Let's hear it, yeah. Uh, your last announcement of exploration drilling results was on February 21st, 2000. Will your next announcement of drilling results be in July, like last year in 2019? Uh, you said in 2000. I assume you meant 2019? Yeah, 2019. Um, yeah. Um, we tend to um, follow the quarterlies. Um, and so... Just because of you know the um, all the listing rules, et cetera, if you put any expiration data out, you've got to put a lot of data out, drill hole collars and things like that. Uh, we tend to put them in a quarter quarter or just before the quarter, and then we can repeat the news in the uh, in the quarterly. Um, if you think about it, particularly from Marigold, um, they're value creative, but they're very low grade. You know our average grade is um, 0.49 grams a ton. 0.48, I think. Um, so the drill holes there, you know, never get actually a lot of news attention. So it's not we're not a company that tends to put out flashy um, uh, expiration results, but we build them up over time. And so if you have a look at the, um, we just put out our new reserve and resource statement when we put the um, Q4 numbers out, so in February, and there was an 18% increase in the Marigold Reserve. Um, which is in a, in the year it's just celebrated its 30th um, anniversary of continuous production. So we're slightly unusual. We have sort of, as I like to call, tell them at site, they have boring numbers all the way through the year and then they have a nice big number at the end. Um, so we do periodically put out expiration up um, releases. If there's something that's obviously market sensitive, if significant, we'll put it out in a standalone um, release. So with that, I'd expect if we, you know, did hit high grade at depth at um, Marigold in terms of sulphide or at CB if we discovered something new along that trend we would put a specific um, expiration result otherwise we'll um, just put it through our quarterly. Thanks for your question Elliot. We'll turn to uh, Heinz Toma. Heinz question today for Paul. Argentina, new government, uh, again a crisis. 
uh, does that affect uh, your possibility to repatriate any funds? Yeah, good good question. Um, Argentina is going through its cyclical or periodic, um, you know, trouble challenging uh, period. Um, I just say it's worth knowing or reflecting on the fact we've operated there since 2009, and during the sort of darkest days of the Kirchner regime, when there were currency controls, etc., in place, we didn't have any issue moving. Uh, repatriating currency. Uh, we sell a concentrate, we move the currency out through intercompany loans. Um, so never been an issue. Um, with the new government, um, they've got plenty of challenges. They have um, certainly, they understand their challenges and they've you know, made a number of changes. We haven't, in because we've just finished building Chinchillas, we haven't tried repatriating currency. Um, we haven't needed to. Um, in the short term, but you know, based on our, um, um, yeah, you know, the terms of our conditions, etc., and what we've done in the past, we don't envisage that to be a problem. But I can't guarantee that they won't change something. But you know, I, the president has stated categorically he understands they need foreign direct investment and that mining and oil and gas is key for them. Um, obviously, mining probably more so than oil and gas in the you know, in the very short term. So. Um, you know, he, he is doing things that are promoting foreign investment in mining. So, um, you know, we're comfortable we'll continue to be able to operate there. And remember, it is only a small part of our portfolio you know, in terms yeah, of growth. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Yep. yep. Thank you, Heinz. We'll turn to Michael Potter. Michael, question today? Hi, thanks very much for that interesting talk. I mean, Marigold's still going well. Um, how deep down are those deep sulfides you're targeting at Marigold? Um, it depends where you are on the property because that normal fault that I talked about lifts it up. So um, the, hole, the first hole we're putting down and we're drilling it now will probably go to about 1.5 kilometres. Um, but we're only doing that just to fully understand the um, lithology and that sedimentary sequence going down. I'd imagine um, the remainder of the drilling this year would be probably kilometre deep holes. Um, and as I said, we're spending about two million this year on those deep holes. We'd be comfortable spending two million a year for the next four or five years. And you know, every, we're also going to do a seismic survey there later this year, which is we've never done that before. What that will help us do is really understand those changes in lithology, which are important, um, and that may also help us. Um, reduce the length of holes. If we see that the target horizons are um, higher up in the sequence in that Trenton Canyon area, then we can drill shorter holes. Ah, thanks a lot. Well, I wish you all the best with that one because if you, if you hit some high grade stuff down there, it, that could be really good. Yeah, absolute company changer that one. Okay, thanks a lot. Thank you, Michael. Uh, we're going to turn to Peter Bell. Peter, great to have you on the call. Hello, thank you very much. And just to ask about, I'm looking at, you know, your involvement with Golden Arrow, Silvercrest, Taiga, Gold Corp. It's interesting to see SSRM working with all these juniors. And I've heard you say a couple times, right, like kind of all or nothing phrase, really, um, which seems to make sense with your focus on continuous improvement, right, that you really want to be operating things yourself to your own high standards. Uh, lots to talk about there, maybe, but I just wonder about price, really, and, and how much that all or nothing decision is really an asset quality decision or, or a market price decision on the target company. Yeah, we, I think we, you're talking specific, or my reference there was Silvercrest. So that's an example where we own 8% of the company. Um, we took a strategic investment there. Um, that's not normally our first route. Normally, we'd prefer to go into the uh, underlying ore body, so we'd prefer equity position in the ore body joint venture. Silvercrest weren't interested, um, so you know, they were controlling the um, discussion. So we took that equity stake. Um, it, well, from our perspective, it's unlikely that we'll stay for a long period of time holding just a you know, near 10% position. So we'll either grow more or less. And we'll make that evaluation based on our view of value compared to the the market's view of value. So if you 
you think about it, it I'm not sure what it is today, but last week the market capitalization was, was around 1.2 billion Canadian. Um, so when we look at it, we'd have to look and say, we think the ore body's worth more than that, including any transaction cost, any takeover premium. Um, and so that's the sort of evaluation we do all the time. And yeah, we'll make a decision based on that. What, yeah, obviously from our perspective, um, whatever we do is no reflection on you know, the quality of the ore body. It's really a reflection on you know, market price versus um, you know, what we think the value is for our shareholders. And maybe if I could ask another specific question just about Fisher there and, and just the order of magnitude difference on the earning that you have, the option for that project and the money you're spending there and the results of it. Yeah. Um, there will be a um, press release that you can go back into our on our um, website, and it would have been towards the end of 2016, and that will have the data. Um, it's we have a certain minimum earn in spend, and I think you know we've exceeded that already. We haven't triggered the the option, um, and we can take it to I, I think 75%, and then we may be able to take it higher than that. Um, uh, in preceding um, years, so you know, it's not something that I'm overly focused on at the moment. I don't remember the exact terms, but th those details are uh, on our website. That help you, Peter? Yep, it does. I appreciate it. High Anything quality stuff there. Thank you. Okay, um, we'll turn to Bob Hermanos. Bob, question today for Paul? Um, yes. Um, I was uh, wondering if you give us some details on the Fisher JV, and uh, also um, how, how yep. deep is the shaft at uh, at CB compared with where the ore body at Santor? Yeah. Um, so I, I just referenced it in the um, um, previous question, and it's actually I've turned to that slide on 29. It actually says it there we can get an 80% earn in by spending you know, certain amounts of money, most of that money going in the ground. I think we've exceeded that already. Um, and then we have the ability to um, move further if we want to. But the, the full details are on our website. Uh, you know, if you look under investors, news releases back in 2016 when we exercised that um, option, those okay. details are there. Sorry. there. And if you, have, if you have a look on page 20, uh, 28, that's the long section through um, CB. Um, through Santoy, sorry, um, it's only the development is only down to 500 metres. We don't have a shaft. This is all trucking to surface on a decline. Um, the old CB mine, which went to about 1.3 kilometres, that's the original mine that was on this property. Um, that was um, had a shaft in it, but this mine is all trucked directly to surface. Based on what we know about the ore body, um, I wouldn't consider that we'd have a um, shaft ever installed here. We'd always run just trucks to surface. Right, thank, thank you. Thanks for your question, Bob. Okay, this concludes Q&A. Uh, Paul, we're gonna turn it back to you for closing remarks, please. Um, okay, what I'll do is go all the way back to that um, you know, beginning slide, because I do think it really encapsulates you know, everything about us, what, what we're... Um, proud of and you know, what we expect to continue in the future. You know, we do what we say we're going to do, we meet guidance. Um, we've got a track record of um, increasing reserves. We're spending the money. We fully expect to continue that track record going forward. We're in a period of, of organic growth. We're in safe jurisdictions. Um, we've got you know, peer leading corporate governance. We've got a track record of adding value through M and A. You know, people always worry about M and A, but I think you know what we say to our shareholders, and I think they have come to fully appreciate it, is we're very, very disciplined. We'll only you know look at acquisitions where we can see value for our shareholders. We won't do it just for the sake of growing. Our internal mantra always is, you know, it's better to miss a good opportunity than to buy a bad one because bad M and A in this industry can you know really harm a company. Strong liquidity and best in class balance sheet, which means two things. One, we can you know, fund any opportunities that come our way. And two, shareholders don't ha have to worry that we're either going to have a stressed balance sheet or that we're going to dilute them through a, an equity raise. So that's where we are um, as a company. So appreciate you taking the time.
Thank you, thank you, Paul. And thank you everyone for your attendance today and we wish you a pleasant evening. All the best to you. Afternoon.